This is One on One. We're pleased to welcome here at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, Troy Lewis, the author of a compelling book called Guess Money. Good to see you. Likewise. Guess Money, an autobiographical account? Yes, sir. Of a uh, young man, six years old? Yes, it's told from my perspective of, as a six-year-old reporter. Growing up in the South? Yes, sir. What Girl, state, Virginia? State of Virginia, a small town called Saluda. Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. Three, yes. So what's going on in Saluda at that time? Uh, when I was growing up, there were only 350 people, uh, and that population has doubled to 769 mm. today. Uh, but I, I would say that Saluda was a microcosm of what was going on around the country. Uh, there were a lot of changes taking place as far as integration was concerned, and we were, we were kind of slow to moving to integration because Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. 1954. 54, right. It took when, us when, did you, when did you guys segregate, uh, desegregate? 1969. I'm sorry, what? 1969. <laughs> Wait a minute. All that time? Yes. And you were in the third grade? Third grade when we integrated. Okay, so integration comes to your community in 1969. You're in the third grade. Mm -hmm. Excited, nervous what? Leading up to that, uh, we were kind of nervous as second graders. We felt that um, white people would not be fair to us. Uh, but on that first day of school, I had a, a middle-aged school teacher, Mrs. Ruth St. John, a white lady who could not have been nicer to me. She asked me my name. And I said, hello, ma'am, my name is Troy Lewis. And she just smiled and said, Troy Lewis, I'm glad you're in my class. I heard a lot of nice things about you. And then she walked away. And she really did change the way that I greeted people for the rest of my life. Because I thought she was going to be mean. But she was nice. And she was nice to me for the rest of my life. Why do you remember that? Um, because I was so apprehensive. So apprehensive of dealing with her, a, a white person in authority. The only white people that I had ever talked to in my life was Dr. Barlow, my dentist, and Dr. Felton, my family physician. And so Mrs. St. John was the first white person besides those two I had ever had a conversation with. The, uh, the book entitled Gas Money is what your third grade teacher gave you, Gas Money? Yes, uh, it's about 40 to 50 people that I write about who gave me gas money gas throughout my life. Gas money for everyday people that we meet in our lives who help us get from one destination to the next. And we never know when that is going to take place. Me being here on your show right now is, is gas money. How so? Well, it's giving me exposure and it's letting people know about my book. But more importantly, what I want people to understand is that we all impact each other's lives. And we never know when that's going to be. And it could be a positive or it could be a negative, but it's, it's what we take from those situations. Mm -hmm. And there are many negative things that I write about in my book. Uh, my mom and dad going through divorce and integration and things that I dealt with in the military. But I always try to find the positive in any negative situation. So you're, you're our mutual friend, Jane, mm -hmm. who reached out for us and told us about you. Gas money? Mm -hmm. So, uh, is that gas money because she told us about you and our producers vet at you and they go, hey, she, he's good. Yeah. That's interesting. Just having a friend reach out. That's, that's the way life works, or at least it has in, in my life. Uh, I've had so many wonderful things happen to me just because of gas money and, and word of mouth. I know it sounds corny, no, it doesn't. But, but it's the truth. I believe in it. I just never... Uh, the gas money concept is so powerful in so many ways. Y your mom, a lot of gas money? My mom is the central uh, character in the book. Um, a lot of gas money is an understatement. I call my mom Mama. And Mama. Yes. And the opening line of the book says, by the age of 16, Mama already had five kids, and she was still a virgin. And so I go on to explain that uh, my mom was responsible with raising her family because my grandparents moved away to the north because they couldn't find any jobs. They were only seventh grade educated. And so they worked as domestics for this rich white family in, in Avalon, New Jersey, in Haverford, PA. And um, they would send my mom money back to Virginia every couple of weeks. So my mom was 16 years old, sophomore in high school, raising her brothers and sisters. And they raged in ages from 13 down to five. And she got them all through school and some of them off to college. 
And my mom never set foot on a college campus until she came to pick me up after my freshman year of, high, of college. You, uh, you experienced some incredibly challenging situations as well, to the point where you write in the book about contemplating whether it was all worth it. Absolutely. I would say that I hit a, a midlife crisis when I turned 50, and uh, that was four years ago. And there were a lot of things that I struggled with in my life and not being content and not being satisfied. And I felt as though I didn't make enough money or I didn't dress a certain way, I didn't look a certain way. And I was kind of a malcontent. And so, you know, I, I, I look back at my life, those first 50 years, and I, uh, gas money gave me an appreciation for those first 50 years. And the last four years of my life have, have been the best years of my life. Because? Because I've become content. You know, I, I was not content. Do you know why? I'm just thankful for everything that I have versus what I don't have. Do you know what changed that 50 for you? Uh, I would say that it was realizing how many people cared about me and how many people, when I was going through my downtime, how many people reached out to me to let me know how much they cared about me. And so I can never thank them for, enough for that. And it, uh, writing the book was therapeutic and it allowed me to take a look back at my life, kind of like Jimmy Stewart and I, yeah. in It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey. And I kind of write about how George Bailey was on that bridge contemplating jumping off of the Bedford Falls Bridge. And I was literally at that point, not a bridge, but in my garage, mm. just hanging out, waiting for the Grim Reaper to take me away through carbon monoxide poisoning. But uh, I had wonderful people who reached out to me and saved me. Finally, people, by the way, this is the book. Get it, read it. What would you want people who will take different things away from the book. Is there one thing you would want them to take away? I want people to understand that every interaction that we have is important. You, you never know how you're going to impact someone and how the way you talk to them, how the way you smile at them or not smile at them, how it's going to impact that person. You never know what someone is going through that particular day, that particular moment. And, you know, going back to Mrs. St. John, you know, I never thought that uh, she was going to be nice to me, but, but she was. Did you ever get a chance to tell her that? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I saw Mrs. St. John about uh, <laughs> 25, 30 years later from that interaction in third grade. And uh, I was married at the time, and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to stop and see Mrs. St. John. And my wife said, Troy, that lady's not going to remember you. I said, she'll remember me because I was her favorite. And so we knocked on her door, and again, this is 1991, 92. Haven't seen her since 1969. I knock on a door, she comes walking down the hall and I said, hi, Mrs. St. John. And she looked at me and she's now in her 80s. And she said, it's Troy Lewis. No way. Yes, sir. And I, I said, hi, Mrs. St. John. And she said, is that your wife? And I, I said, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, well, he was always my favorite, is what she said to my wife. And she said, come on in here, let's sit down and talk. And so we sat there and we had a cup of tea and we ended up staying for a couple of hours. You were right. She, she did remember you. Yeah. You were her favorite. Well, I don't, maybe she said that to every student <laughs> who stopped by. Well, all I know is it mattered to you. On that particular day, I was her favorite. It's a powerful message and it's an important book. Troy Lewis is the author. Gas Money is an incredible title and it's a message all of us can learn from. Troy, I want to thank you for joining us here at the Performing Arts Center. Thank you for having me. All the best. I appreciate it. Stay right there. Man. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Well done. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by TD Bank, Cone Resnick, Gibbons PC, Josh S. Weston, The Fidelco Group, The Northward Center, and by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.